the turn of the century, the railways had spread so far throughout the country that few people lived more than 10 miles from a station. All the main lines had been completed, the Great Northern to Belfast, the Great Southern and Western to Cork, the Midland Great Western to Galway, and the Dublin Southeastern to Wexford, which had grown out of the original Dublin to Kingstown Railway. From these main lines, branch lines spread out into the most remote rural areas, forming a cobweb of services operated by a multitude of companies. The dream of the early pioneers had been realized, and the land was truly ironed. But in the 60 years that it had taken this to happen, circumstances in Ireland had changed dramatically. The world of the railways knew, and in a way the world of the railways made, uh, vanished in the 20th century. Uh, it vanished partly because the First World War um, put enormous strain on labour costs, um, partly, I think, more fundamentally, more enduringly, obviously because of motor transport, uh, lorries, buses and so on, create, uh, well, a very powerful rival where the railways previously had virtual monopoly. So if you've enjoyed a monopoly for 70 or 80 years and suddenly you're faced with very powerful competition, which you have very little opportunity of countering because the railways are fixed. Mind you, it had taken some ingenuity to reach the more remote parts of the western seaboard. In Donegal, there have been over a dozen lines, some going only a few miles. While down in County Clare, a branch line was to achieve immortal status. Well, the narrow gauge is actually a quite rational response to the economic circumstances of the west of Ireland. Uh, no railway company would advance into the far west. And we're talking about uh, Dingle Peninsula, we're talking about parts of Clare, we're talking about parts of Connemara, uh, would advance that far on the standard gauge. Uh, it would cost too much to build the lines. Uh, they couldn't uh, make a profit on the capital costs incurred. So what do you do in those circumstances? Well, you look for a narrower gauge. And they were built at something like a third or a quarter of the cost of the, the, the general railway system. And they undoubtedly helped develop uh, the areas. Many of them were never profitable. And uh, the books say about one company that only existed for about 18 months. But, um, there was great public unhappiness with the railways, a belief that the railways should be able to solve all sorts of problems that they weren't solving. Ireland was one of the worst countries in the world from a railway man's point of view, not physically, but economically. What do railways need? They need big urban centres between which there will be massive passenger traffic. We haven't got that in Ireland. There was basically only Dublin, Belfast catching up, but for a number of reasons, the amount of traffic between Dublin and Belfast was relatively limited. Belfast looked outward, Dublin looked outward. They both looked parallel in a way, rather than one to the other. So you don't have the type of passenger, or the type of, of um, demographic structure that's necessary for a thriving passenger trade. In Dublin, the trams, which had been horse-drawn, gave way to motor-driven, with huge increases in customers. But if worldwide the railways were being threatened by the combustion engine, in Ireland the upheaval of the World War was not eased by the end of that war in 1918. The effect of the rebellion of 1916 and then the civil war running into the 1920s meant that the railways were surviving from crisis to crisis. There was no space to address its underlying and deteriorating economic state. During the Civil War, the uh, irregulars, as they uh, were officially described, uh, they um, sought to disturb communications which would be used by the Free State Army to travel from one place to another quickly. And if they could isolate uh, parts of Munster from uh, Dublin and the Free State Army, well, you know, some... Uh, important advantages would be achieved. So there was great interference with the railway. 
In the two years of the Civil War, 400 locomotives were damaged or destroyed. Lines and bridges were blown up. About a third of the network was rendered inoperable, mainly in Munster. The railways were threatened with closure until this fearsome machine went into action, a kind of tank on tracks. One's whole training uh, as a railway, as a railway man, and certainly as a railway manager, uh, the whole ethos of, rail, of one's background and so on, would have left very few of them, I think, anti-treaty. By the 1920s, much had changed for the railways. Since 1916, wages had risen three times higher than receipts. A new native government led by W.T. Cosgrave was trying to put a new shape on many aspects of life in the free state. It didn't take long before the Cosgrave government took the initiative of approaching the railway companies and saying, we want you to agree an amalgamation scheme. Uh, and gave a deadline of, let's say, 18 months, whatever the period was. Uh, and you come back to us with the scheme, and if you don't come back to us, we will take the initiative and we will decide how you should amalgamate. And they did agree on the scheme for amalgamating all the railways uh, with four or five exceptions. Most Irish railway companies became incorporated into the Great Southern and Western. The company now had more than 2,000 miles of track and 600 locomotives. And the effect of absorbing the many smaller companies was a saving of half a million pounds in 1927. But even with incorporation and the closure of some of the more unprofitable branch lines, the rising costs of coal and labor in the 1930s again led to losses. On top of that, the railway companies were facing increasing pressure because of competition from road transport. In the 1930s, with the advance of road transport for passengers and freight, uh, action was taken by the Common Oil government and then by the Fianna Fáil government as it came in in 1932. Uh, three acts in all, I think, which, um, with regard to passenger transport, uh, road passenger transport, introduced a licensing system for buses. Didn't mean that uh, private operators couldn't exist, but private operators would have to uh, seek a license to operate a route, they would have to publish a timetable, they would have to have their fares approved. That's how the railways coped with the competition of buses, by buying them out and running them themselves. Now timetables could be coordinated for road and rail, but that of course put more pressure on those small lines all over the country which served small communities at a leisurely pace, but which on an accountant set of figures didn't make sense to keep open. Well, Irish railway life in general, it would be fair to say, had a fairly relaxed rhythm. Uh, and the further west you went, which meant the further narrow gauge you went, the more relaxed it became. And uh, obviously the West Clare Railway is the classic, and Percy French is the classic uh, exemplar of all of that. But that wouldn't be too far out in catching what you might call the, the dynamism of, of life uh, in that part of the world. And why should it be different? Uh, after all, why chase around all day if you're only going to have a couple of trains puffing back and forth? The downside was they couldn't create the jobs for the people who were born there. The upside was that for many of those who stayed, uh, there was a relaxed rhythm of life, as I've said, and the railway fitted into that life rather than transforming it. In fact, there's a case for saying that much of the Western seaboard in the 1930s was as much in the late 19th century as in the 20th. Bled by emigration, subsisting on small holdings, the real world was outside. And yet the railways were a taken-for-granted passage to that outside world and the people and families who worked on the railways knew a security of tenure that others didn't have. In my case, my grandfather started life on the Kalana Road, the road between uh, Ballina and Kalana. And again, the records will show that in 1913 that he moved up to Athlone and the company supplied him with a railway house. By 1939, I got a call 
and I got temporary work on the railway for a beat season in 1939, and I left the technical school for 10 weeks, where I got a first glimpse of what life was like in a local shed. And uh, I presented myself for interview, and my interview with uh, Mr. McKay was three minutes in the shed yard. It was a very, very busy yard. It was a big number of steam engines coming and going and great activity. Uh, there was a number of cleaners cleaning engines and there was engines being called and there was fires being cleaned out and a uh, tremendous amount of work going on. So the foreman gave me three minutes. He says to me on a Saturday evening, while he looked out at the battery hills, he says, if you come in at half past eight on Monday morning, he says, Tommy Hinshaw will give you a start. So with my father's overalls, I arrived a fresh faced cleaner at the shed in uh, 19, October of 1939. And I was presented with a scraper and I was told to scrape the wheels of steam engines. At the end of the week, when you got your 25 shillings, which was the rate in those days, and there was one and threepence stopped for a stamp, uh, you forgot the misery of the week when you got this wonderful pound in your hand and you give it to your mother and you head on to the three and sixpence for, to enjoy yourself for the rest of the week. The 1930s were a lean time. There was an international recession following the Wall Street crash. Even in isolated Ireland on the edge of Europe, there was a knock-on effect, compounded by the so-called economic war with Britain, which affected the cattle trade. One of the most important businesses for the railways was the carriage of animals, of live animals. Uh, and as that was affected adversely for some years, uh, the railways um, suffered and that in addition to the uh, advance of road freight uh, by whether by contractors or by private individuals uh, moving their own freight or uh, just traveling contributed to the, to the deterioration of the railways the reaction of governments when they're faced with a serious quandary is quite predictable they set up a commission or a committee in this case, the Commission concluded there's insufficient income to meet liabilities. In other words, the railways were broke. Again, they balked at taking them in hand and paying for them. But as the debate continued, the outbreak of the Second World War changed the nature of the problem. The war was now on for six or seven months. And uh, the coal stocks were now drying up. Like the railroad company would have thousands of tons stacked up over the years and that they would buy from Yorkshire and from Cardiff. That's where the best quality coal came from. So for the first few, few months, I found a tree and ran with, with monotonous regularity. You could set your watch, but then suddenly the good quality coal was gone and they were now relying on native fuel, which was turf and timber and a type of bricket, and they tried everything, but they couldn't maintain uh, the pressure on the steam engines with this poor quality coal and it led to an awful lot of frustrations and trains ran out of path. The train that would normally come in from Dublin uh, in two hours and a half, it might be five or seven hours before it arrives. And then arriving in the zone, the fire would have to be cleaned out and uh, a lot of turf put up on the footplate and into the firebox and timber and the driver and fireman, as best they could, they would carry on to Galway a further, further 48 miles. All in all, the overall trip from Dublin could be now 78 hours. People were fortunate to get from Dublin to Galway. And then there came a time where we only had two passenger trains a week on Tuesday and Thursday, because whatever supplies they had, they kept them for the goods trains and the movement of cattle trains, which were essential. It's not because we don't realize the nature of the odds we have to beat. Le Mas, one of those key figures credited with modernizing Ireland, proposed a new company which would be an amalgam of private and public ownership. It would take under its control most of the railways and private bus routes in the state, as well as the Dublin United Transport Company, which ran the trams. It would be modeled somewhat along the lines of the ESB, it would have the commercial freedom to operate in the market, but with a first requirement of public service. Sean Lamass, then Minister for Industry and Commerce, said um, there was going to be a shortage of oil and petrol 
uh, the railways is, are going to be the main uh, system of public transport. Uh, there are going to be coal shortages. It whole system needs to be taken on taken under government control, uh, and we will uh, pay the bill virtually. An acrimonious debate in the Doyle resulted in De Valera resigning on the bill to set up a unified transport company which would cover the whole country. Defeated over the transport bill on a technicality, as the uh, opposition thought, uh, but it gave him the opportunity to seek a new mandate, which he got in 1944. The uh, bill creating Corazon Perverden was then... Uh, passed by a substantial Fianna Fáil majority and uh, Corazon Perverden came into existence on the 1st of January 1945. It's, it's worth noting that um, around that time uh, CIE had about 500 steam locomotives in, in perhaps 80 different types and, and the average age, I think, of those engines was about 50 years, which just um, shows how little had been invested in the railway since the turn of the century. Far removed from the debates of economists and statisticians, the railways had embedded themselves in the social life of the country. Trains were part of everyday life, more especially in provincial Ireland, where a day trip or a journey to town became an event and an adventure. On the wider national scale, the growth of the GAA was enhanced by the rail network. We'd normally leave Valencia Harbour, that's called Renard Point, at 10 p.m. We get to Houston at 6:30 a.m. Then our mission was somewhere to get mass, wash ourselves, and have a bit of breakfast, and head to Crockberg. I was often Crockberg long before 12 o'clock before the gates opened. You could probably argue that until very recently, the railway had been an essential, an essential medium for the, the fostering and the sustaining of the DAA at the level which has made it such a fantastic national organization. Not for the first time, the railways were becoming something of a political football between parties. As ever, too, the government was blamed for a severe winter, or at least for the failure of the railways to cope with it. No sooner was CIE uh, set up than uh, the post-war crisis of fuel supplies uh, be became a serious problem. Uh, Britain had very little coal for export. The winter of 1947 was one of the worst in, 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 in recorded uh, meteorological history. Um, some locomotives were converted to oil burning, but really the railways were in, in an extremely difficult uh, condition. The first inter-party or coalition government took office. Daniel Morrissey, uh, Fine Gael minister, um, businessman, auctioneer, became minister for industry and commerce. He gets a letter from Reynolds of CIE to telling him uh, that CIE was going to now lose uh, a quarter of a million last year and in the coming year it's going to lose almost a million. So by 1949, within months of the Free State becoming formally a republic, the new Republican government finally did what other governments had strenuously avoided. They nationalised the railways. Which is to say, the new republic bought them lock, stock and barrel. And then there could be no avoiding um, the fact that public transport, and particularly the condition of the railways and the loss that they were making, were very much in the political domain and politicians um, had to be answerable um, for the problems on public transport in the country. For all its claims to sovereignty, the new republic of the 1950s could not provide jobs or housing for much of its people. Emigration resumed on a scale and momentum not seen since the Great Famine of a hundred years before. It was like a, a clatter of clay and stones on the coffin. There really was a terrible finality about it. And of course I know now that it was the old life ending. And then there was the guard whistle to stand clear. And you'd hear the engine getting up ahead of steam and the carriage couplings jerking the line. And after that, 
we wave the handkerchief and we watch the handkerchief disappearing over the top of the hill there. Like much of the West, the Ross Common area was badly hit. Albert Reynolds was a railway clerk, later to become a TD, then to hold government portfolios for transport, and later again, Taoiseach. I left school at a very difficult time to get any job in the early 50s, and uh, actually the first permanent job I got was with uh, CIE and the railways, uh, goods and, and uh, office, ticket office uh, Directly officer at a place called Drummond, County Leitrim. I remember one afternoon where a friend of mine was, was taking the, the train to Birmingham, or taking the boat to Birmingham, as it was more commonly known at the time. And uh, he, had, uh, uh, he had arrived at the ticket office with three pounds for a ticket to Birmingham, which at the time was two pounds, uh, ten shillings. Uh, it'd be two pounds fifty in today's, I think, two pounds, ten shillings. And he handed in three pounds, and that's all he had. And when I gave him out the ticket and the, and the change, I says, uh, Mel, do you have any more? And he said, no, that's my lot. And he had a brown parcel under his arm with a few bits of clothes or something. So I, I, I took back in the ticket and I got a different one from the very end of the stock. And I gave him out to one. I gave him back his two pounds, ten shillings, and said, look, uh, the best of luck, and I hope you make it. 24 years later, as minister, I walks into a function in Birmingham, and the first guy up to me is a guy called Mel Farrell from Ruski who then, by then, had a family of six, had done very well, and says, I owe you three pounds. I said, no, you're to CIE. <laughs> by 1955, we had the diesel era, when 60 engines were bought from Metropolitan Vickers. The steam then was phased out, and we had mixed feelings What's in those big engines and small engines. We always remembered them by their number. They were always numbered, and eventually went to the torch by 1963, so at the end of the steam. While these changes were taking place, even while branch lines were being closed, the trains provided excursions and days out, holiday and seaside visits, football and hurling matches, even in the fallow 50s, there was music and merriment on the trains. But for all that, the losses continued to mount. But should they be regarded as losses or as necessary subsidies? On the one hand, why should a railway, which was performing a valuable public service, be expected to pay its own way? On the other, if the taxpayers no longer wish to subsidize it, should it be scrapped? Todd Andrews was to prove the most controversial, and some would say formidable, head of the railways. For 30 years or more, this abandoned stretch of the line from Harcourt Street to Shangana and Dundrum has been the way Dubliners remember the man who, as the sentence has it, closed the Dundrum line, even as plans were made to house thousands of commuters along its route. But there was a lot more to it than just this, and of that we shall journey some more next week. Train on a journey, train on a track Take me where I want to go, take me back Building the line by the sweat of your brow And the strength of your own hand With stone, steel and sand, burning the land Railway sleeper, get no rest Ride the iron horse into the west With a pick and a shovel to the mountain pass The boys of the Barrow Gang With stone, steel and sand Ironing the land Well, if you'd like to learn more about the history and relevance of the train system in Ireland, or indeed recapture the magic of this series, the book Ironing the Land is available from bookshops nationwide.